afternoon, everyone. I want to thank everybody for joining us this afternoon for our committee's bipartisan virtual forum on business interruption insurance. I especially want to thank the panelists for being with us here today. On March 11th, the World Health Organization declared the outbreak of COVID-19 a global pandemic. As the virus spread across the country, many state and local governments issued stay-at-home orders and forced the closure of many different kinds of businesses in order to mitigate the spread. As a result, small businesses operating in retail, food service, hospitality, and many other industries have virtually ground to a halt. Knowing that the future is uncertain and that many outside factors such as natural disasters may force a business to close for extended periods of time, small business owners purchased business interruption insurance to guard against precisely this kind of uncertainty. However, in recent weeks, insurance companies have begun forming, informing their policyholders that their business interruption insurance policies do not cover pandemics, frustrating many of these holders. Many small business owners and others are wondering why coverage is being denied for business interruption if it does not cover situations like the shutdown caused by the spread of COVID-19. Although some of these contracts may explicitly exclude losses resulting from pandemics, most insurers are still denying coronavirus-related claims, even if they do not have those exceptions in those policies. We've heard many insurers argue that business interrupted insurance only covers physical damage to the property. Some small businesses have decided to litigate the issue in the courts, but that might take years to resolve, costing these small businesses time and money that they do not have. We must always keep in the front of our minds that most small businesses, especially startups and micro businesses, do not have a team of lawyers on staff. Yet often the exclusions and exceptions contained within a business interruption policy are buried in the fine print. After years of paying their premiums on time and now having their claims denied, many small businesses are left wondering what they've paid for and continue to pay for these policies despite ongoing closures. Whether it's years of costly litigation or more likely denial of coverage on a BI claim by a small business, it is an unacceptable outcome as either would only exacerbate the losses and unsustainable costs small businesses are facing because of COVID-19. At a time when millions of small businesses are struggling to stay afloat, the unemployment rate is at levels not seen since the Great Depression. And our healthcare workers in particular are on the front lines battling the spread of this virus. We must all do our part to fight this health and economic crisis. Therefore, it's incumbent on Congress, especially this committee, to work with effective policyholders and interested stakeholders to chart the appropriate path forward. Now, we are mindful that this is actually a complicated issue. There's a lot of, of very uh, uh, very difficult dynamics at play. That's one of the reasons we wanted to convene this forum so we can start to flesh out those issues and start having that conversation. But the alternative where we don't have this discussion where small businesses don't get any relief resulting in permanent closure of many businesses, uh, already we're seeing many of those permanent closures, is just unacceptable. So I look forward to hearing from our distinguished panelists today what the challenges these policyholders are facing the challenges of the insurance industry and their perspectives as well, as well as some of the potential solutions that are being discussed. Again, I want to thank the panelists for joining us here today, and I now yield to the ranking member, Mr. Balderson, for his opening statement. Uh, good, good afternoon, Chairman, and good morning to you, I guess. It's still uh, before noon out there in Colorado. So, um, hey, thank you for putting this together. Uh, since the month of March, COVID-19 has swept across our country with a fury that is unrivaled in our modern history. As a way to respond to this pandemic, states have restricted activities and limited businesses operations. Unfortunately, small businesses have been forced to close, causing an economic freefall. To combat this downturn, Congress and this administration have worked to create multiple relief packages to assist individuals, employees, and businesses. Just over the last handful of days, states have turned their attention to recovery and starting preparing plans to reopen. As the nation looks to recover, so will small businesses that populate the main streets of America. This committee has a long record of creating an environment where small businesses, entrepreneurs, and startups can succeed. Providing our nation's jobs creators with the resources required to climb out of this pandemic and instrumental to the entire country's economy. 
The subcommittee form today will explore one of the topics that has been in the headlines over the last few weeks and months. Specifically, how does the role of insurance operate within and during a pandemic that has caused and this causing such economic harm? Like me, many members of Congress have spoken to hundreds of small businesses that have deeply impacted by this crisis. The topic of business interruption insurance has come up often in many of these conversations. I'm looking forward to having a comprehensive conversation on this topic today. Businesses in my state of Ohio are struggling. I know that I am not alone in saying that we need to help them return to normal operations as quickly as possible. However, we must do this in a safe, prudent, and fair manner. I want to thank the chairman for gathering us today, and I especially want to thank all the panelists also with Chairman Crow. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Balderson. Appreciate uh, the opening statement. Um, so I want to take a moment to just explain how this forum is going to proceed. Uh, each panelist will have five minutes to provide a statement, and each committee member will receive five minutes for questions. So please ensure that your microphone is on. Uh, I'm, I'm guilty of this too. Often uh, I'll get into my speech and have a great start uh, and realize that I've been muted. So uh, uh, we're, nobody is immune from the, the mute button. So please make sure that your, uh, your button is off as you uh, begin to talk um, and, and, uh, and that you're situated appropriately. Uh, and, and also please ensure that you turn your microphone off when you're done. Um, and, and I will do the same so you don't have to hear my dog barking in the background. <laughs> so with that being said, uh, I'd like to thank our panelists for taking time out of their busy schedules to join us. With us. Uh, so with us today, we have Chris Morrow, uh, owner of a Northshire Bookstore located in Manchester Center, Vermont, in Saratoga Springs, New York. Uh, Francisco Schlatterbeck, CEO of Maya Cinemas in Pasadena, California. Uh, Mark Shaker, the co-founder of Stanley Marketplace in Aurora, Colorado, actually just about a mile from my home. So I know Mark and uh, the Stanley Marketplace quite well. Uh, and John Hodeling, the second managing partner of Guthier Murphy and Hodeling LLC in Metairie, Louisiana. Uh, also, Sean uh, Kevalingen, uh, president and CEO, uh, Insurance Information Institute in New York, New York. Apolo apologies, Sean, if I uh, butchered uh, your last name. Uh, uh, and uh, thank you all for being here. Uh, so I want to begin by recognizing Mr. Morrow uh, for five minutes. Okay, thank you very much for having me. <clears throat> Good afternoon. Uh, as you said, my name is Chris Morrow. I run two bookstores with uh, combined 2019 annual sales of around $7 million, and I employ about 45 people. Uh, my stores are in two different states, New York and Vermont, and are separate legal entities, so I carry different insurance policies for each store with different local um, insurance agencies and different national insurance companies doing the underwriting. Uh, I have long carried business interruption insurance, but uh, unfortunately have never, but fortunately have never had the need to use it. Uh, as soon as I was shut down by COVID, I inquired as to my, as if my policies would cover the shutdown. My claims for both stores were rejected, citing language in the policies. Uh, there were virus exclusions and the need for physical harm to the buildings. Um, <clears throat> honestly, given the length of the policies, the arcane language and my substantial workload, I had never really read the policies fully. Um, you know, I try to mitigate my risk as much as possible as a business owner, but the insurance companies are uh, clearly much better at that. My New York store has been completely shut down for two months with a loss of almost $400,000 in sales, over 99% decline since 2019. Um, we just opened yesterday for curbside pickup orders. My Vermont store was also closed for almost two months, but we were able to maintain curbside delivery and internet fulfillment during that time. In that store, we were down 32%, almost $140,000. Uh, so between the two stores, my sales loss uh, since the closure is north of $538,000. You know, for a small family business, that is impossible to overcome without help. Uh, it sure would have been nice if my business interruption insurance policies covered my business interruption. 
Uh, a pandemic is an insurable risk and has been modeled and reinsured in the past. When one occurs, it is likely to result in a total cessation of business. Um, however, as the insurance companies are staying far away from this liability, Congress uh, must take action by contemplating a solution to provide business protection against future pandemic risk, which some anticipate could come as early as this fall due to a resurgence of the COVID-19 virus. Perhaps a public-private partnership of some sort would make sense. Um, you know, I am not an, an expert in any of that, and we'll leave that to you to, to structure a good solution. Um, I just want to take a second to talk about the Paycheck Protection Program because this was um, uh, partly designed to, to mitigate the impact of business interruption. Um, it's a well-intentioned effort to address these hardships. Uh, unlike many in the country, I had a very good initial experience. I applied on the first day and had my money not long after. Um, for both stores, different banks, different processes, and it, and it worked very smoothly. Uh, the application was concise and easy to understand. However, it's, there's clearly some problems with it. Um, it was very narrowly focused on just keeping people employed for two months. Uh, it was not about keeping my business healthy and viable for the longer term, a byproduct of which would be continued and stable employment for my staff. Uh, the eight-week period to spend the money is too short. The 75-25 split is too restrictive. Um, the IRS letting us know a month into this program that the expenses paid for by the PPP would not be able to be deducted as a normal business expense changed the whole dynamic of the program to make it unappealing and against the intent of Congress, as I understand it. I would not have taken the loan in my New York location if I had known this tax implication. And finally, the lack of clarity on specific important aspects of the forgiveness parameters and the slowness in getting clarification from the SBA has made has been frustrating while I'm trying to make business decisions on a daily basis with people's jobs at stake. Uh, all of this is to say that I would be it would be prudent and greatly appreciated if Congress acts proactively to come up with a business interruption mitigation scheme that is timely, comprehensive, and takes into account the on-the-ground realities of keeping a business going in a time of crisis. So that the next time there is something like this, uh, hopefully not in the near future, um, Congress is prepared in advance and businesses know what to expect. That is my opening statement. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Morrow, for sharing that. And uh, thank you for staying exactly on time, too. We, we appreciate uh, your attention to that and look forward to uh, hearing more about your story. Uh, Mr. Uh, Schlotterbeck, uh, you are now recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Well, hello, everyone. Good afternoon, uh, Chairman Crow and ranking members, Balderson and members of the committee. So my name is uh, Francisco Schlotterbeck. I'm the CEO of Maya Cinemas based here in California and Pasadena in the uh, 27th uh, Congressional District. Thank you for the opportunity to speak on behalf of my fellow movie theater owners and share my experience with Maya Cinema Business Interruption Insurance Claim. First, let me uh, tell you a little bit about Maya Cinemas and the crisis we and other movie theaters are, cu are currently facing. Maya Cinemas was founded in 2001 with the mission of bringing the movie-going experience to underserve, underserve sorry, Latino community. We own and operate six cinemas in California and Nevada and employ over 400 people, over 70% of whom are Latinos. Maya Cinemas welcomes 3.5 million guests to our theaters annually to share the experience of seeing a movie theater on the big screen. We are a minority owned business committed to bringing our unique brand and cultural sensibilities now and for years to come to these underserved Latino communities that absolutely love going to the movies as a family. Unfortunately, we now find ourselves in an unattainable financial position that threatens us as a terrible prospect of having to close maybe our door forever. The movie theater industry is now completely shattered and as severely distressed as possible due to this pandemic. 
We closed our cinemas in mid-March to comply with order from Governor Newsom in California and Governor Sisolak in Nevada. Overnight, we went from having a strong box office ticket sales to having zero revenue. Not only are the movie theater industry current, <coughs> current dif difficulties extremes, but its recovery will be really difficult due, due to this unique structure of our market. To break even, much less I'm making a profit. We will require a steady supply of new movies, as you know. Without new movies, we simply cannot draw the minimal audience levels necessary to justify the cost of being open. The industry does not expect any new films until late July this year. Moreover, even when we do reopen, we will be subject to the capacity limit. Of course, we will comply with all the prudent measures to reopen safely, but doing so will continue to suppress our revenues, which will have a long-term impact in our company and the rest of the movie theaters. One of the first steps we took after we were subject to disclosure orders was to file a claim with our insurer for business interruption coverage. Prior to COVID crisis, we had purchased three policies that could provide coverage to us in the event of any cessation of our business operation of the kind we're currently experiencing. Specifically, we purchased business income coverage, civil authority coverage, and ingress or egress coverage. <clears throat> our policy was paid in full when the pandemic started, and we have continued to pay our necessary premiums, despite not receiving a single payout. But claims under all three of our policies were denied by our insurer. First, business income coverage, coverage should have been triggered when our operations were suspended because we did not report direct physical loss or damage. However, our insurance concluded that this coverage did not apply. Second, civil authority coverage should have been triggered when access to the area around our property was prohibited by civil authority. Our insurers deny civil authority coverage as well for the following reasons. One, it deemed we could not satisfy the condition that there was damage done to the property. Second, it concludes that any potential damage was not caused by a qualifying reason. And third, it found that the gover governmental order shutting down our theater wasn't due to physical damage. And third, ingress or egress coverage should have been triggered when ingress or egress to our property was prevented. Our insurer also denied that coverage because the prevention of ingress or egress was not due to direct physical loss or damage by causes specifically enumerated in our policy. Furthermore, the insurer denied our claim because even if we had sustained direct physical loss or damage to our property, the loss would have been caused by a non-qualifying reason, including a virus or a government act. These exclusions are extremely common in business interruption insurance policies, and it is virtually impossible to negotiate this exclusion with insurers. The world and our country have already felt the terrible impact of this pandemic on so many levels. The failure of our movie theaters would be an irreparable loss to the social, cultural, and economic fabric of our lives. We stand ready to work with the Congress on preventing the loss of movie theaters and ensuring our industry's survival and to find solutions that will prevent other long-term damage to our economy and our society as a result of this pandemic. Thank you for considering the needs of the movie theaters and all other severely distressed industry. I conclude here. Thank you very much. Thank you, uh, Mr. Schlotterbeck. Uh, appreciate you sharing uh, your story. Uh, Mr. Shaker, you are now recognized for five minutes. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Balderson, thank you for your time. My name is Mark Shaker. I'm the uh, owner of Stanley Marketplace. Stanley Marketplace is a urban marketplace in Northwest Aurora, comprised of 56 all local independent businesses. Uh, way back when, Stanley Marketplace was the ejection seat manufacturing facility adjacent to the former Stapleton Airport in Denver. And um, as the airport moved to the Denver International Airport, the whole Northwest area of Aurora became dilapidated and left behind. Our building sat vacant for eight years before we came and resurrected it and turned it into a thriving metropolis of small businesses. Uh, within that, we have 56 small, local, independent businesses. We opened our doors three and a half years ago. It's the, it's the epitome of a small business sort of story. It was, it was put together by neighbors that lived in the area trying to find 
a community gathering spot, took ideas from New York and San Francisco and other places between, and tried to bring something to Northwest Aurora that would revitalize an economy, revitalize a neighborhood that had been left behind once the airport moved. Part of our requirements for our businesses was that every single one of them had to have business interruption coverage. We call it the family when a tenant signs a lease and we'd have family meetings every week. We review policies with everyone. We would go through different best practices. This was two years before we opened our doors and we continued that practice for three years after our doors opened as far as ways to support one another. In the beginning of March, we could feel what was coming as far as our um, sort of our in, impending fate. We met regularly with the city of Aurora to, and the Tri-County Health Department to figure out what our next steps were in the case of the civil, uh, civil closure. And once we received notice from the city of Aurora, the head city manager and their deputies, we closed our doors. And it's been that way for over two months. Uh, we are slated to open at the end of this month. But in the interim, we put together a cheat sheet for all of our businesses. They include how to apply for PPP funds, how to apply for EIDL funds, how to apply for different city of Aurora grants, and then also making sure that they all tried to activate their business interruption coverage. As we did that, we continued meeting virtually uh, with all of our businesses and found ways to go. We are small time landlords. So we are, we are not some big entity. And we let everyone know that we're gonna go through this journey, linking our arms and finding a way that we can kind of get through the other side, but everyone was gonna feel some pain, but our goal was to find a way for every business to succeed. And as we've gone through that journey, we've all had to make negotiate settlements with all of our creditors. Us as landlords, we gave two months free rent to all of our tenants. And then we went to a straight percentage of sales through the end of the year. And we kept telling everyone, our goal is to bring everybody back. We need to find a way that we're gonna bring everyone back and for these small businesses to succeed, to succeed. In the meantime, everyone applied for their business interruption coverage and all 56 claims were denied. And they represented every imaginable insurance carrier some of them had specific virus policy in there and some of them did not, but in any case, every one of them was, survived, was, was denied. And now we're in a situation where we've gone through great lengths to find sacrifices for all of our tenants. We've gone to our lenders and our creditors and said, you guys need to find ways to help support us as we get out of this. We've come up with virtual, um, virtual platforms. We started our own TV network, stanleymarketplace.tv. We're opening, we're about ready to open a big, it's called the Backyard at Stanley. We're gonna have football size tents as we try to bring the marketplace outside. About 15 of our businesses are doing curbside at about 40% of their total volume. And the rest of our businesses are finding ways to do either curbside virtual opportunities and looking at ways that we can get through to the other side. So we've continued brainstorming and using our innovative hats as far as finding ways that we can uh, you know, get through this. But in the meantime, we're all buried. <clears throat> the PPP, as I think Chris mentioned uh, very eloquently, uh, has been helpful, but has its limitations. But we have retailers that are sitting on inventory. They can't move. It's a season out of date. All of our restaurants are essentially opening new restaurants. Their working capital is gone as they've tried to take care of all of their employees. They sat on inventory. They couldn't move. And now they're in a place where they have to open at 25 to 50% capacity, which just does not work for anyone that is familiar with the food and beverage industry. So we are, we are searching our heads. We're trying to find ways that we can uh, get through on this. Um, it's disappointing that every one of our claims has been denied. This is exactly why we made all of our businesses take this time of coverage for things that are unforeseen as we mitigate our risks. Um, and, but we're problem solvers. So we're here to try to figure out and maybe propose or be a part of any particular legislation or, or um, answer to any of these questions that we're posing that can help not just myself, but all the other folks that are on this line. So I appreciate the time and thank you for allowing me to share my piece. Thank you, Mr. Shaker. I appreciate uh, your time and for doing all the things you're doing to try to um, get through this. Uh, Mr. Hodeling, uh, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to thank the committee for the opportunity to speak to one of the most important challenges facing American businesses in modern history. I'm general counsel of the Business Interruption Group, the acronym BIG, a nonprofit of nearly 3,000 companies and business associations across America in every state, including the New York Times Alliance, the New York Hospitality Alliance, the Independent Restaurant Coalition, the National, the National Independent Venue Association, the James Beard Foundation, and nonprofit sectors uh, with, with uh, members such as the Simon Wiedenthal Center. We are nonpartisan. American business owners come from every party, 
and every town. If you're an American worker, chances are you work for a business that has taken out some of its profit every year and paid it to an insurance company for payroll expenses, in part during a civil authority shutdown. American businesses expected protection on the eve of these shutdowns. For many of them, there was no exclusion for pandemic or viruses. The proverbial lifeboat was paid for. And yet, when American businesses made claims on these policies, they have been uniformly denied regardless of the property language. Millions are now on unemployment lines, and many American businesses now face bankruptcy. The insurance industry has offered several reasons for the denials. They repeat the refrain that policies do not cover pandemics. They say all policies have virus exclusion or pandemic exclusion. This is simply not true. Not all policies have exclusions. Some actually have virus inclusion coverage. The word, in others, the word virus or pandemic does not even appear in the policies as an exclusion. Insurance companies, however, are uniformly denying the policies no matter what the policies say. Prior to the shutdown, the insurance industry knew that many of these policies did not have virus exclusions that they put into policies following the SARS incident in 2003. Instead of preparing to pay these policies, they prepared a defense. They argued that for coverage to apply, a civil authority shutdown must be because of a dangerous property condition and covered loss in the area of the shutdown. So what insurers did is they proactively went out to agents and brokers, and they said that the civil authority shutdowns that were about to come were only going to be about social distancing, that they weren't going to at all have to do with a dangerous property condition, which was a covered loss in the area, which triggered coverage. Um, they ignored the warnings um, and the reality that we were hearing from civil authorities that COVID-19 sticks on surfaces. It causes a dangerous property condition and loss. That the cleanup of this is triggered, that triggers civil authority coverage under the policies. They show charts now that they don't have enough money to pay these policies. Well, American businesses are also facing a problem of not having enough money, but they know that one's ability to pay doesn't impact the duty. The insurers claim that they don't have enough money because they point to 800 billion in claims reserves to de demonstrate their solvency. They don't mention their reinsurance or the, reinsur the fact that they've reinsured these policies. Insurers and American businesses are at odds about what the policies will say. The insurance uh, will, they will draw on claims reserves now to pay lawyers to defend these policies in the largest civil litigation battle in human history. Both sides will argue case law. The insurers will win some of these battles and American businesses will win others. And insurers will spend billions defending the claims as, as American businesses will. If we do nothing, if we leave the hands in the battle, we leave the battle in the hands of lawyers, American businesses will fail. In one sector alone, the restaurant industry, four out of five businesses will go bankrupt. Now, several proposals don't work. Uh, we side with the industry. We don't believe that retroactively changing policies to knock out exclusions is constitutional workable. We also stand with the industry that class actions or ideas that are more for lawyers than for individual rights of business owners is not the answer. But today we need a big compromise. Uh, we need a win-win and we offer one to the committee. We propose an optional program for the insurers allow insurers to voluntarily opt into a federal program. If the word virus appears in an exclusion, the carriers can voluntarily pay those policies in exchange for federal reimbursement. This program will work. It will avoid the litigation costs. It will avoid us and people like me litigating over the ashes of these, of these businesses. So I thank you very much. Thank you for the time. Thank you, uh, Mr. Hodeling. Uh, Mr. Uh, Kevlin, am I pronouncing that uh, properly? Is it Kev yeah, Kevlin? that one's good. Okay, that one I, I've improved. <laughs> so, <laughs> no, I appreciate it, and I have no pride in yeah, Yep, uh, You are recognized for five minutes. Uh, well, thank you, uh, Chairman Crow and Ranking Member uh, Balderson and esteemed members of the Innovation and Workforce Development uh, Subcommittee. 
On behalf of the Insurance Information Institute, or III, I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to speak before the committee on behalf of America's property and casualty insurers and reinsurers. Um, just for some, some brief background, III is a 60-year-old nonprofit organization that was founded by the insurance industry with the intent of informing and empowering the customer. Uh, we are a trusted source of objective, data-driven insights that help customers understand how to manage risk. Uh, we don't directly lobby, nor do we sell insurance to the, through the III. Insurance has a proud 350-year history of supporting innovation and prosper prosperity for Americans, uh, individuals, businesses, communities. Uh, the industry is there to help Americans recover. We like to consider ourselves financial first responders uh, when those catastrophes, those covered cat catastrophes happen, such as a hurricane or a tornado or a wildfire. With each of these, the insurance industry works with it urgency, um, and we make sure that we're settling and paying claims. Uh, the fact is there are always going to be disputes with claims, but in the end, 99% of claims are paid. The shock of COVID-19 has obviously devastated the U.S. economy. And understandably, Americans are seeking solutions so that we can create more financial security in this time of uncertainty, and we want to get the economy up and running. And while the industry is eagerly working to provide the solutions that it can, we also need to be mindful that there are limits. In particular, an event like a global pandemic is uninsurable. Unlike typical catastrophe, uh, where, the li where it's limited to, to terms of geography and time, and as an example, you can use 9-11, where for the most part, the two economies in New York and Washington, D.C. had the heaviest impact. What you're looking at right now is all of our economies in the U.S. and many throughout the world are all being impacted all at the same time. And given this unpredictability and, and really unimaginable potential for, for loss, insurance is simply unable to underwrite or cover a pandemic like COVID-19. Uh, this concept is expressly clear in standard business interruption policies. Uh, we reviewed and accepted by regulators. Uh, we work hand in hand to make sure that even so far as the type size is regulated in the right way and standardized. So in order to provide more clarity as well, I, I think we need to step back and understand what we're talking about in, in terms of property and business insurance. It is meant to cover various physical risks that would jeopardize or force a closing. And that would include a fire or tornado. Uh, Congressman from, from Colorado, Hale would also be a good example of that. And when these unfortunate events happen, uh, insurance customers can and should make a claim. Business interruption policies are offered as an add-on to the general policy to cover loss and in income, continuing expenses. If you're closed, then you can have those, those expenses if you're being repaired or need to rebuild. But this is all from circumstances that involve direct physical damage. Um, also important to note, only about a third of U.S. small businesses actually choose to have business interruption coverage. So understanding that the, the industry is heavily regulated, these, are, these policies are approved by regulators. And I would draw your attention to statements by the likes of the National Association of Insurance uh, Commissioners that have made it quite clear that business interruption policies were not designed or priced to provide coverage with, against a communicable disease uh, such as COVID-19, and therefore there are exclusions in standard and typical policies. Um, I'm, I'm encouraged to hear um, the, the, uh, the thoughts about retroactively paying these claims. Uh, simply one, uh, retroactively payment or re redesigning a contract is unconstitutional, and that's clear in Article 1. But it would also imperil, imperil the industry's ability to pay covered insurance claims filed by American homeowners, drivers, injured workers. Uh, one of the things that we just need to make clear is retroactive business interruption payouts would bankrupt insurance. We did a recent economic analysis. We determined this approach would decimate the industry's financial resources in a matter of months. Uh, we did, I did hear and mention the industry surplus. Uh, just to put that $800 billion in context, uh, if you look back at the last three years and the, the claims that the industry has paid, it's equaled one point, nearly $1.2 trillion. So the $800 billion seems like a large number, but when you're talking about increases in severity of catastrophes that are happening, and in fact have happened over 660% more since the 80s in terms of loss costs, you're looking at, it, they sound like big numbers, but in fact the, it's well designed for the industry to be able to pay claims 
and keep the keep the promises that they've made to those customers that have paid premium. So we don't want to take those premium dollars away from where they're supposed to go. Uh, we know as well that the federal government is truly going to be the most effective way to originate a solution. It's the only entity that has the financial resources available to help businesses impacted by government mandated quarantines. So solutions, and I'm encouraged to hear again that we're talking about federal solutions um, and we're encouraged as an industry to be a part of those discussions. And that's why we were part of, the industry was part of more than 40 trade organizations coming together, uh, restaurants, hospitalities, supporting a proposed federally financed program known as the COVID-19 Business and Employee Continuity Recovery Fund. To help better inform the public, uh, the broader public. So Mr. 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 Kevlin, uh, uh, your, your time expired about a minute ago. So if you could wrap it up, I'd appreciate it. Yeah, the, thank you very much. The time, is, uh, this is a time to come together and work toward recovering from this unimaginable and uninsurable catastrophe. The insurance industry is stepping up. It's paid back over $10 billion to, on auto insurance claims. We've contributed 220 million in charitable funds. And we look forward to having a fruitful discussion today, looking at forward-looking uh, solutions. Thank you for your time. Okay, thank you, Mr. Kevlin. I appreciate all that uh, all of you shared with us uh, today. I'm gonna begin by recognizing myself for five minutes. Uh, so let me begin uh, with uh, Mr. Shaker. Uh, uh, Mark, you, you talked in the beginning about some of the, the shared um, approach that you're taking to this issue. The fact that you are recognizing that we're all in this together and you're you know trying to, to, to share uh, the pain, frankly, uh, with with your tenants, and you're both a small business yourself, and uh, you're uh, a landlord to small businesses. Uh, so, um, would like to for you just to paint a picture, very briefly, if you will, on the impact of your marketplace on the surrounding community and kind of the outsized role that the the um, the marketplace has played in reinvigorating uh, our area of of, uh, of Colorado. Uh, number one, and then. Number two, you know, a lot of there's been a lot of discussion here today about the the physical damage element here. So, from your perspective as somebody that that has both indoor and outdoor spaces, uh, uh, if you could uh, shed some light on how you view this as a physical uh, damage or hindrance to your business, uh, and, and what you're doing to try to uh, 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 you know work around some of the physical restrictions on your business right now. Sure. Thank you. Uh, yet. Um... You know, Stanley Marketplace has, uh, we've created about 560 jobs in a uh, in a zip code. That's one of the bottom five. When we started, bottom five zip codes in the country as far as median income. And we've worked at finding ways that we are bringing all four sides of our project uh, together. Uh, you know, this, this pandemic came about pretty quickly as far as what we had to do as far as pivoting. Um, the shared pain I mentioned, one thing that we've done, I mentioned, I talked about the the free rent and the discount of it. We had to go to our lenders. And so we got nine months of deferred payments on our loan, which is something that we're eating and, and we'll eventually have to pay back as far as debt uh, once we are able to sort of pay, uh, get back on our payment plan. And we've looked at really hard with all of our creditors as far as finding ways to defer payments as much as possible. One of the frustrating elements is that while our banks have been uh, kind, uh, the SBA has paid six months of payments, um, not just deferred them, but made payments for all of our small businesses, but everyone is still paying full insurance premiums. It's the only, it's the only line item across the board that we are still paying in full. It's been challenging because, you know, we have obviously frustrations that none of our claims were, were accepted and we're still, while our doors are shuttered, you know, businesses that were doing 200 to $500,000 a month, um, have, have no revenue or borrowing funds so they can do it. The PPP funds does not allow those summer payments for it. So, um, you know, we are constantly trying to find ways to innovate our our specific, uh, one of our businesses, the Stanley Beer Hall, which I own, has partnered and become a part of the Colorado Restaurant Response, in which we are working with the city of Aurora and private donors to produce meals for uh, food insecure. So those that are hungry in our area uh, has gone up fivefold in the past two months. So we've, cons uh, we've converted our restaurants that are no longer able to have customers into charitable entities that are distributing food to those that are needy and, and have food security issues. The other challenge is gonna be once we open our doors and as we are opening our doors to limited capacity, whether it's 25% or 50%, the you know, business model doesn't work. That. We're trying to find ways that businesses can eat their way to their, but operational costs will go through the roof. We will do temperature checks by doors, people come in, 
disinfectant and clean supplies has gone up three to fourfold. Our labor costs for our common areas is up twice as much, three times as much. We have to add security so that we can make sure everyone is maintaining social distancing. So we're looking at a prospect of significantly reduced revenue with significantly increased operational costs. Um, you know, and we'll fight through, but it's 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 certainly daunting. Thank you, uh, thank you, Mr. Shaker. Uh, so I'm going to um, I'm going to reserve my questions uh, after I give the other folks a, a chance to uh, chime in as well. So, uh, Mr. Balderson, uh, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, making sure I was unmuted there. Uh, my, my question uh, is for Mr. Kevlin. Mr. Kevlin, uh, good afternoon and thank you for being here. Kevlin, excuse me, Kevlin. Uh, as I've examined these issues, one of the things that really sticks out to me are the dozens of efforts across states and some here in Congress to go back and rewrite insurance contracts to force insurers to cover losses like those associated with pandemic risk that were not accounted for when insurers calculated the cost of premiums or business interruption coverage. Helping our small businesses get back on their feet and succeed in the face of this economic crisis is a top priority for me, as it should be for every member of this committee, and I know that it is. I have major concerns with the legal consequences of forcing insurers to rewrite established contracts. I also have concerns that these efforts would hurt the goal to aid small businesses as quickly and efficiently as possible and could ultimately lead to insurers being unable to coverage businesses that need protection from natural disasters, storms, fires, other catastrophes. Would you describe the effect rewriting contracts would have on insurers? That's my first question. Uh, and my follow-up to that would be, in your mind, would this work against the goal of helping small businesses as quickly as possible? Thank you. Uh, thank you, Congressman, for, for the question. Um, the answer is simply um, it would take a matter of months to put systemic strain on the insurance industry as a result of re retroactive payment of contracts that honestly were never written in that way. Um, we do have an industry surplus, as it was pointed out earlier. Um, through a regulatory process that established about 30 years ago, uh, once we the industry gets to about $400 billion in industry surplus, that, that is a strain in itself. And we ran some economic analysis, and I understand the clerk has distributed um, some of these charts and analysis to, to you all, and I encourage you to review them. We, we did some scenarios based on if you would retroactively fit it to just that 30 to 40 percent of, of businesses that bought business interruption, and we also fit it to if you did it to every single business and in, business insurance contract out there. The estimates are anywhere from $150 billion a month cost to, to close to $400 billion a month. And so again, depending on how you look at the scenario, if we look at the best case scenario, let's call it, where you're only applying it to those that, that uh, bought business interruption insurance, by the time you're getting uh, through the year, you're looking at about 400, a cost of about $485 billion and clearly getting into the, what I, you know, where that gaslight comes on in terms of the systemic pressure that is applied to the insurance industry. Okay, thank you. Mr. Chairman, how much time do I have? I can't see a timer, so I'll make sure I don't go over. Uh, I think he's muted. Mr. Chairman, you're muted. You got two minutes, Troy. All right, thank you. Uh, my follow-up then, uh, Mr. Kevlin, is is it true that in general, standard business interruption policies are not designed to respond to a complete economic shutdown? Uh, yes, Congressman, that is true. Uh, standard business interruption policies have language, uh, which is 100% clear that excludes or virus and bacteria is the term used in the policy. And these policies are created hand in hand with the regulatory community. Uh, they, they go right into the, the, the issue of potential fine print when they, they regulate the type size. Um, and and this, for this reason, you will have exceptions. And we've seen exceptions and maybe heard of exceptions where people do buy the coverage. It's, it's quite costly. Uh, one instance for the All England Club in Wimbledon, uh, they were paying $2 million a month uh, so that it was included. And those claims were paid out. So, but standard policies 
uh, simply do exclude it. Thank you. All right, Mr. Chairman, I, I will yield back my remaining time. Thank you. Okay, thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, now I recognize Mr. Golden from Maine for five minutes. I almost, Chair, are you on? I almost fell victim to the mic there, uh, Mr. Chair. So thanks for reminding me uh, at the beginning there. Um, I was going to ask uh, a number of questions about uh, from Mr. Morrow and Slaughterback and Shaker uh, about the nature of uh, coverage denials, but you all pretty much summed it up in your testimony. Uh, so I don't have uh, too much to ask uh, of the three of you, but I do thank you for your testimony and uh, I'm sorry for the situation you find yourself in. Uh, I wanted to ask Mr. Kevogan, uh, I'm sorry uh, if I mispronounced that, uh, and feel free to correct me so I get it right. But you you have, I think, described that economically, this may not uh, be a situation that insurance companies can afford. Um, could you say something about the damage to insurance companies that you might expect um, from this recession and the loss of clients uh, with business closures around the country, uh, not only temporarily, but perhaps uh, on a long-term basis. Are, are, are insurance companies concerned about how this is gonna impact them as well? Uh, absolutely, thank you, Congressman. Uh, absolutely, um, in addition to ensuring that we wanna make sure that we're keeping our employees employed um, so that we can be there and pay the claims for insurers. There's there's no doubt that the industry will face challenges, but but we we would like to think it's facing those head on. Um, overall, you're going to see claims increase in the likes of workers' compensation, where healthcare workers and first responders in particular are exposed. Uh, we've also seen now a, a rise in delivery type claims that you'll see when people are driving in different ways and in different in different areas. Um, you, you will see revenue decrease in insurance because we have that surplus and we hold fu funds on hand to pay claims for the long term. Um, it's dedicated to the, we do a lot, there's a good amount of investment and it's in fixed investments. And so the rate environment is, is going to no doubt do that. But uh, we're, we're preparing as well for, for even more severe natural covered catastrophes, uh, right? We've seen, as I mentioned, an increase in and losses in the industry from the 80s has increased 660 percent. 2017 was a record year. So, thanks for that. You know, uh, Mr. Uh, Hogtelling alluded in, in his uh, testimony, uh, you know, a desire to put something on the table for the committee to think about in regards to a compromise. What did you think about what he offered? And if that's not uh, an acceptable solution, in your opinion, you know, what might uh, you suggest the committee think about? Uh, as somewhat of a, a solution here? Well, it, as I mentioned earlier in, in my testimony, the, the, the IIII itself is not a, a policymaking or a lobbying organization. Uh, we usually, what we typically do is when there is a, a type of policy there, we will analyze it and discuss it as a whole. Uh, I know that the industry and those trades that do the, the advocacy work have been high, heavily engaged with what I would call the policyholder community. Um, and that that was reflected in the letter I mentioned about the the fund that you could put together in a relief fund, a federally backed relief fund. And so uh, encourage, I mean, the industry is coming together and collaborating itself. It's trying to collaborate with the policyholder community. I know everybody is looking towards solutions. Uh, I believe that that those solutions will be presented and the insurance industry will be part of that. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I'd, I'd leave any time uh, I have left to Mr. Hogtrilling. If you have anything to add, uh, don't feel like I'm putting you on the spot, though. You're muted. Thank you. Thank, thank you very much, uh, Congressman. I, I appreciate it. Um, so I think that there's a question um, uh, going back to the industry. As I said, we agree that retroactively going back and changing policies is not the answer. But also uh, it's important to, to, not, um, uh, to recognize that if we're going to live by the language of the contracts themselves, we should live by the language of the contracts themselves. And there are a lot of policies that do not have virus or pandemic exclusions in them. Um, and the president has recognized uh, this when he spoke to our organization 
directly and, and afterwards, that there are policies that do not, many manuscript policies, many do not have the virus or pandemic exclusion that you're talking about in these forms. What the Business Interruption Group wants is we want the contracts honored, the contracts that were paid for. Um, and, and, and that's what we want. Now we recognize that there's going to be disagreements and there's going to be fights. And that is why we are proposing that on those instances where the insurance industry truly has a clear exclusion that they've put in their policies, that, that, that we have a program that we have a program for that. Thank you, Mr. Hogtill. And with that, out of fairness, to everyone, my time's expired and uh, back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, uh, Mr. Uh, Golden. Gentleman yields back. Uh, now I'd like to recognize <clears throat> Mr. Chabot from Ohio, also the ranking member of the uh, full committee. Uh, Mr. Uh, Chabot, uh, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you very much. And uh, uh, having been the former uh, chair of this committee and uh, the ranking member currently, uh, I've been involved in dozens of conference calls with other members across the country on various aspects to the PPP and uh, the EIDL loan program and a whole range of other things. Um, and uh, the topic of business interruption insurance came up uh, quite often. Um, and uh, Mr. Uh, Kevin, let me go to you first if I can. Uh, could you expound a little bit upon uh, the, the concept, the, uh, the, the, the thinking behind uh, uh, insurability of pandemics, um, and uh, also the, the, uh, the fact that the importance of uh, damages uh, being a physical damage and why that is the case, and, and if you could just expound upon that whole, that whole issue. Uh, absolutely, and thank you. Thank you, Congressman. Um, you know, as I, I mentioned earlier, I think probably one of the best illustrations, and and that th these illustrations are are contained as well in that in that deck that you were uh, that was distributed. But if you look at at, at a catastrophe um, in parallel, and and one that we was was severe, uh, where almost every type of insurance was paid out was was nine eleven. Um, and, and so, but in nine eleven, what you, what you had uh, obviously the whole country was impacted in some way, but primarily in nine eleven economically. The areas of New York and Washington D.C. were where it hit most, and and so then that's where I mean when you know usually you're insuring against a, a time as well as specific, specific time period as well as specific geographies and and the industry what what why the industry has been around for so long is it spreads at risk in in, in ways so that all in, in a way that they don't want again what's happening in a pandemic where everything is striking at the same time. So every single economy in this country, as well as many other countries around the world, are being impacted. And when you have this type of risk, and this type of risk simply wasn't, in a majority way, written into contracts. And so we never prepared for it as an industry because we knew we couldn't cover it. We knew the costs would be too high. In fact, there have been some times where, where pandemic insurance was offered. And there are instances, and. And I would argue, say, over the, the the millions of insurance contracts that that are in in this country, there are there are many that have inclusions. Uh, but but again, we there there are also very many the standard policy that that have to exclude this just because of the magnitude and unpredictability of this. Um, and and so that's that's really and then the direct physical damage right, you're you're talking about the property part of the policy uh, that you know protecting the property itself, and so. That's why you you have to look at direct. It's about physical damage, direct physical damage, and that's something that has been established in in the legal fields. Our non-resident scholar Michael Menapiece has has made note of this, uh, in, even in going back to the mad cow disease, uh, where certain claims like this were made. Um, it, it just legally the definition of direct physical damage is that anchor of of coverage there. Thank you, and then let me, let me follow up. I. I happen to have chaired the Constitution Subcommittee of Judiciary for six years. So I'd like to ask you, um, could you uh, uh, talk about modifying an existing uh, contract, uh, the, the constitutional issues that may be involved in, uh, in, in such a measure? Yeah, and 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 I know um, we and, and I'm encouraged actually by uh, Hotang, uh, Mr. Ho Tang Lang's uh, recognition of this, and he is absolutely going to be a better expert on this than I am. But Article One of the Constitution makes it quite clear about going back and retroactively 
applying uh, things to a contract. And so that therefore, um, and again, this is this is a pretty early part of our constitution that we're talking about that that made this this quite clear. And so for that reason, uh, any attempt would be unconstitutional. Thank you. And then finally, I'm almost out of time. Uh, Mr. Morrow had raised something that I wanted to maybe uh, uh, give him some, uh, some relief. Uh, we have legislation that's being introduced in a bipartisan manage, uh, manner, uh, Chip Roy and Dean Phillips next week, uh, that will address uh, positively the 75-25 uh, rule, also the deductibility of business expenses. Um, and extending the eight week period. In this bill, it goes 24 weeks. I think that might be modified by the time the Senate gets its hands on it. But uh, I think there's reason to believe that there will be um, some improvement there, although that's only the House and has to, it has to go through the Senate. But I think there's a lot of support in the Senate as well. The PPP was great, but we didn't, uh, uh, there's a lot of things that we couldn't anticipate. We didn't know how the pandemic was going to play out. So it needs to be modified. And I think there's some good news uh, coming down the road on that. And I yield back. Thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, now I'd, I'd like to go to uh, Ms. Chu from uh, California. Uh, Ms. Chu, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you so much. And uh, I am uh, uh, pleased to have uh, a constituent of sorts uh, here, uh, uh, Francisco Schlotterbeck, the CEO of Maya Cinemas, uh, that uh, you have your headquarters in my district in Pasadena. So thank you for being here and for sharing the voices of uh, the theater owners. So Mr. Schlotterbeck, on April 1st, the California delegation sent a letter to State Insurance Commissioner Ricardo Lara, urging him to exercise his authority to ensure that insurance companies fully comply with their business interruption policies and give small businesses full and fair consideration for their claims during the COVID-19 pandemic. I'm pleased that soon after, Commissioner Laura directed insurers to fully investigate the claims and provide adequate assistance to policyholders as well as process decisions in a timely manner. Could you talk to us about your experience working with your insurer during this crisis and whether you feel your business was given fair consideration to submit a claim for coverage beyond addressing the exclusions for pandemics. How can this process be improved to make it easier for small businesses to quickly get their claims processed during emergencies? Sure. I mean, that's um, that's uh, the uh, the other panelists. I mean, they already expressed in the uh, in this uh, in this forum. That's been uh, really difficult for us because I mean, when when you going after this uh, insurance to try to be covered in all these different, I mean, aspects, and I mean, because I mean, no, nobody's wanting to have an epidemic situation. We try to be pretty, I mean, pretty sure that we're covering everything. I mean, it was uh, came up our attention that I mean, this uh, physical loss, uh, physical direct damage, was an, uh, an, uh, the uh, something that is going to trigger. I mean, in order to our 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 claim is going to be successful. Unfortunately, I mean, we try, we try, we work with the uh, with our broker. Um, we had several conversations with our broker. We had a conference call with the uh, with insurer, right? Uh, our insurer uh, company uh, they called us. I mean, actually last week, we had a very long uh, conversation, and it's pretty much, I mean, the uh, the answers that we had is is it's is pretty it's pretty same that the uh, the, the answers that we have in here. Um, in listening in this forum, right? I mean, physical damage, I mean, the exclusions, I mean, unfortunately, I mean, it's a no civil authority, I mean, and et cetera, right? So, so we, ex we, uh, we explain, I mean, uh, in our, uh, our business is small, right? As I'm too many theaters here in the US, there's family owned business. I mean, they are in exactly the same situation. And we offer, I mean, uh, different options, I mean, to explore for the future, right? I know there are, and uh, currently uh, there are two, I mean, bills, I mean, working in the process in the legislation that, I mean, uh, Maya Cinemas, I mean, is I mean, really, I mean, supporting those uh, those two bills, right? Because, I mean, we need something for the long term, right? I mean, I don't see that something is going to be fixed today, right? I mean, um, I, I don't I don't, I don't, don't believe that something is going to fix maybe next year, trying to change uh, changing the uh, the, the contract, but I mean, we need to we need to have something I mean strong for the future, right? Because if not, I mean, today I mean we don't know. As I said in my statement, we don't know. I mean, when we will be ready for the reopen. And the act, to be honest, I mean, the reopening 
it's not my it's not my um I I don't I don't I don't have issues with the reopen. I, I I'm not afraid of the reopen. I'm more afraid in regards to the ramp up period, right? Because that ramp up period is gonna take maybe two, three, four, six, seven months, a year, right? When uh, our customer they feel or all the people here in the U.S. they're gonna feel comfortable to go back to the theaters, right? And that is the uh, and that is the um, that is the um, solution, of course, using this business interruption policy in order to have an, a long-term solution. That is that is the most, I mean, since, I mean, we are severe uh, distress, I mean, our theaters are closed for almost, I mean, two, three months, I mean, zero revenues, as I said before. And, um, and of course, I mean, our partners are the uh, studios distribution, right? I mean, the studio, Hollywood studios, and they provide films because we don't have, we, we, we could able to open, reopen the theaters, but I mean, maybe we'll, we will not have content, right? So what we're expecting here is, is to work as an industry to have our studios provide the content, which is the movies, in order to be able to reopen the theaters, right? So um, again, I mean, I, I mean, we support any le legislation today. It's it's, uh, it's a, a, already, I mean, in the process. Um, I read two of them. So, I mean, we support that. I mean, and of course, I mean, I will happy to have, I mean, some some answers back from our insurance company that we already talked last week. I mean, because I mean, they said, I mean, we can submit a, and a, and a, and a resubmit our claim, but I mean, for sure, we will hear, I mean, the same answer, this, the, the same no, right, in regards to, to our claim, okay? So thank you very much. Thank you so much. My time has expired and I yield back. Thank you, the general lady uh, yields back. Uh, now I'd like to recognize Mr. Hearn from Oklahoma for five minutes. Uh, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Hearn. Chairman, thank, thank you. And thanks to our witnesses for being here today. The, the contract clause of the Constitution states that, quote, no state shall pass any bill of attainer, ex post facto law, or law impairing the obligation of contracts, unquote. And while I'm not a constitutional scholar, and I don't know that we have any on this this call today, but I'm all, I've been a small businessman and, and a person who has owned many small businesses and worked with contracts for over 35 years, sit on insurance boards, I understand about swapping risk for premium. And you know, also understand how when you when you don't really truly understand a market, how it can be affected by monumental changes that the committee is is charged today, and, and what we're talking about. You know, artificially expanding insurance company liability beyond the plain terms of their policies would completely undermine our insurance markets and do much more harm than good. Many businesses do their work in America due to sturdy foundation on which our contract law rests. In fact, it's one of the qualities that this country has that I would say no other country in the world has. They know that when they sign a contract in America, it will be honored and that breaking it will have repercussions. To undermine this would be completely disastrous. Um, as you may know, uh, the risk of pandemics is typically not included in the price of business interruption insurance policies. Uh, business interruption policies typically require physical loss. This requirement exists beyond this because this policy is written and priced to cover events that cause direct physical damage like fires or weather events. Requiring retroactive expanded coverage of business interruption claims based on COVID-19 would undermine American contract law, pose significant risk to the solvency of insurance companies and have systematic impacts on the whole industry as a whole. For these reasons, I'm happy that my colleagues at the state level, Oklahoma Insurance Commissioner Glenn Mulready and Oklahoma Attorney General Mike Hunter have rejected efforts from federal government to rewrite policies and enforce coverages. Mr. Kevlin, can you please elaborate on the impact that this would have if Congress retroactively expanded coverage of BI claims? I know you've talked to it, but could you give us some further thoughts? You know, in, in, in the simplest way, um, you're, you're looking at you know just a matter of months before, before you put systemic strain on the insurance industry through retroactively fitting contracts. Um, again, our economic analysis depending on how you look at it, whether you apply it to those, you know, third or 40% of, of contracts that actually have the business interruption, or if you fit it to all business interruption or business insurance policies, you know, it, the range is anywhere from $150 million a month in costs to $400 uh, billion in costs. And, and understanding that that, that, that that premium was never written for. So you're essentially taking premiums away from, from those Americans that paid uh, for covered catastrophes. And as we're seeing right now, we've got a very active tornado season. Uh, we want to, Another of our non-resident scholars uh, from Colorado State University who puts out the hurricane forecast has predicted an above average hurricane season. We've got waters right now on outside the Florida coast that are 
in the 90 degree range, which if you go back in history, that 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 looks a lot like the year of Katrina. And I, I don't mean to, to, to apply or make people worried about it, but this is what this industry does. We do disruption. We know and how to cover for those claims that, that we want to, to help Americans. And we're, we're actively doing that right now, but I think we also need to step back and ask ourselves, you know, do we want to put systemic strain on another financial services? Um, I, we, if we go back just to the financial crisis, I think we, we've learned our lesson as to what, what can happen there. And this property casualty industry was able to withstand that crisis much better than most financial services because of the way that we apply, manage our risk, the way that we look to the long term, the way that we hold assets so that we can keep our promises and pay claims. And I think we just need to recognize this is important for our economy, and we want to make sure that we don't destabilize that in any way. Mr. Kevin, thank you. Uh, you know, Mr. Chairman, uh, there's probably been no one on this committee since I got on here uh, over a year ago that's been talked about the bipartisanship this committee has had. However, I'm kind of gravely concerned today. Uh, you know, our witnesses have expressed their concerns, and you know, business people from different points of view. But I got to say, you know, Mr. Hodling represents a very interesting partisan position that uh, he's been a very large donor to the Democrat Party over the years. And he's currently involved in a major lawsuit against the insurance industry. And just today being admonished in the media for his involvement in companies with deep ties to both China and Russia. So I find his testimony very opportunistic at the best. But, you know, that I understand that um, we weren't aware of this when we were invited on the call. But. I just want to say, and we've had a lot of testimony today, and I think all of my colleagues here would rec recognize the fact that uh, we have to have uh, our premiums match the risk. And right now, pandemics are the risk of a pandemic are not understood. Uh, there are no actuarials for those. And so, again, I thank you for the time, Mr. Chairman, and I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Hearn. The gentleman yields back. And then I will say, uh, as the chairman of this committee, I've appreciated the professionalism uh, and the approach of all the panelists. Uh, and uh, it, it's not appropriate for any member of this committee to impugn the integrity of a witness or to claim that there is uh, ulterior motives or conflicts of interest by any of the panelists, uh, which we have not seen in any manner whatsoever during this hearing. Uh, uh, and I uh, would push back uh, vehemently on that point, Mr. Hearn. Uh, so next we have Mr. Evans from Pennsylvania. Mr. Evans, you are recognized for five minutes. Dwight, you might be on mute. I'm on mute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I thank you for this hearing. A constituent law firm in Philadelphia sued its insurer after it was forced to shut down on March the 16th by state and local order. Because of the shutdown, the firm was unable to meet with potential clients, get new businesses, or move any litigation forward. In addition, it cannot collect fees on the clients because of the shutdown. The firm's insurance content include coverage for businesses. I want to take this question to Mr. Holing here. You filed a similar suit in Louisiana. And based on these conditions, do you think an insurance company should provide coverage? Please explain. Uh, yes, I think they should. I, I think they should live their contracts. And um, and I do find it, um, I do find the ad hominem attack against me and my integrity um, uh, to be very partisan in and of itself. Um, uh, we have an industry here, an insurance industry, which is has a conflict of interest with businesses in America that have bought business interruption coverage. Um, and I, I appreciate the pointing pointing out about democratic support of my of myself, but I've also been, been a very big supporter of the, of the Republican Party. So I'm completely nonpartisan. Um, the President of the United States uh, gave, a, gave an audience to our organization because it understood that businesses in America, businesses in every one of the congressmen's uh, towns and in every congressman here in America are facing bankruptcy. Okay, if, if business corruption policies are not paid, then the constituency of every town in America is going down. Um, now, the situation is that this is this is a conflict of interest with the insurance industry. There is no question I am on the side of American businesses, and the insurance industry is on the opposite side of this. Okay, there isn't any question about that. 
But what, and, and there also is not any question about the fact that, that we don't want to, to change policies. But it would be absolutely improper. And, and the congressman brought up the fact that as an American businessman, you want to live by your word. You want to make sure your word is your bond. And when you take policy premiums from businesses for, for, for sometimes decades, for sometimes more than four decades, and you sell policies of insurance, then you should live by the words of those contracts. And if you look at the words of those contracts, okay, if you look at the words of those contracts, it states in extended civil authority coverage that if there is a dangerous property condition in the area, and that is the reason for the civil authority shutdown, and that, that dangerous property condition is a covered cause of loss under the policy, there is insurance coverage for that civil authority coverage. Absolutely. And the, and the, and the idea that has been planted, okay, that has been planted around by being pushed out by agents, by brokers who have a conflict of interest here, that pushing out to policyholders that a property condition is a contamination that, that can be deadly to my parents is not considered to be a property loss, is not supported in the fact, it's not supported by the law. Now, if the insurance industry wanted to exclude pandemics, as President Trump said, they could have done so. But as the president said, there is no, the word pandemic does not appear. I've looked at over more than 500 policies in the last eight weeks. I have found two where that word appears, okay? So there's going to be fights about whether or not viruses in different parts of the policy and how much that constricts the policy itself. But we should live by the words of what we do as Americans. And if we do not do that, then businesses across the country is going to fail. The idea that this is a partisan, some type of partisan issue is not. It is American businesses that are at stake, and it's the employees of those businesses that are at stake here. And if we can't, if the insurance contracts need to work. The device of insurance needs to work. If the device of insurance needs to work, it doesn't just affect the insurance industry. It affects every business in America. If they pay for coverage and the, and, and the words of that contract show that there's coverage for civil authority shutdowns and other parts of that policy, then the insurance company should pay that. And what's happened here is we're conflating contracts that have exclusions with contracts that do not. The insurance industry doesn't want to pay the contracts no matter what they say. And this is a problem. I think that the sanctity of the words of the contract should matter as much as the insurance industry. The problem is that the insurance industry is intentionally misrepresenting the fact that all of these policies have exclusions. In them. I thank you, um, Sol. I, th I thank you, Mr. Chairman, for this opportunity. And for this hearing, I think this discussion is long overdue. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Mr. Evan. Uh, gentlemen, uh, yields back. And uh, before we recognize the next member, I'm going to just give a reminder to all the members on the line. Uh, this is a very challenging time, a challenging issue. Uh, we are in the midst of a crisis. Uh, obviously, emotions are running high. There's a lot at stake here. But every single one of the panelists have been professional, are giving their time, their talents, their experience. Uh, and they have uh, provided uh, perspectives on this very complicated issue. Uh, and, and that's the point of these forums, actually, to have a, a discussion about tough issues. Uh, and I want to remind the members that we will not uh, tolerate uh, any member uh, impugning the integrity of a panelist uh, or uh, accusing them of some kind of ulterior motive other than just advocating for their position on this issue. So uh, with that reminder, I uh, would recognize uh, Mr. Hagedorn from Minnesota for five minutes. Uh, Jim, thanks for joining us. Uh, you have five minutes. <clears throat> Chairman, thanks for uh, holding this hearing. I appreciate uh, you and the ranking member, Mr. Balderson, my good friend, for, for putting this on. Uh, I actually would like to associate myself with my, uh, my friend, Mr. Hearn's comments. I thought he brought up some good comments. And at the end of this, I'd be glad to yield him some more time if he's still on the line and would like to talk. But you know, early on in this whole process, when this pandemic broke out, there was a letter circulated. I actually signed on to it that said, if uh, these things were included in insurance policies, that uh, they should be paid. But my understanding was there were very, very, very few uh, policies across the country that would uh, that would cover something like this. And it makes it's you know it's common sense when you think about it. Uh, an insurance company is usually out to to make sure like. Uh, 
Chairman Chabot, former Chairman Chabot said, uh, a house burns down, you have a hurricane in a region or area, a tornado, but you're, you're not gonna go out and cover the entire country. Not every single business in the entire country, nobody thinks of that. Now, since this has all gone down, our committee, our, our uh, the members of Congress, our taxpayers have stepped up with the Paycheck Protection Program. We put out about almost $700 billion for small businesses in many ways for two or three months have served as insurance companies to make sure they continue operations, retain their employees. Mr. Pappas, a, a Democratic member from New Hampshire and I, uh, were encouraging the Employee Retention Tax Credit. And now we have a bill of Mr. Pappas and I, along with Congresswoman Murphy, that would allow people to use both the Employee a retention tax credit and the PPP program. So there are lots of things going out there to, to help our small businesses and to, to help people maintain operations, stay in business and to get back to work. And I think as Congressman Ballerson brought up, reopening America is, is important. Getting people back to work, as I say, flattening the unemployment curve, that can be as important as anything. And um, I guess uh, down the road, if someone wants to answer this question, how much is this proposed program that we've been talking about today going to cost the taxpayers? Nobody's brought up a real number as to what uh, what we're looking for. But with that, if uh, if Mr. Hearn is uh, still with us and he'd like to reclaim some of my time here for a minute or two, that's fine. Uh, if he doesn't, then I'm happy to yield back my time, but I give him that opportunity. Okay, hearing nothing, uh, Mr. Hagedorn, are you are you uh, yielding back? Back, thank you. Okay. Next up, uh, we have uh, Mr. Schneider from uh, Illinois. Mr. Schneider, you're recognized for five minutes. Great, thank you, uh, Chairman Crow, and thank you for organizing this important forum. Uh, as always, this committee's leadership and staff has worked that, uh, incredibly hard and, and the critical work, critical work you guys are doing during these uncertain certain times are, is truly making a difference. I also wanna welcome all of our witnesses and I, we may not all agree, but I think it's important that we treat each other with due respect and, uh, and hear different perspectives. Uh, so I thank you for sharing your insights and perspectives. Uh, one of the reasons I like working on this committee, I've always liked being on this committee since I first came to Congress. Uh, I started before Congress, I was a small business owner and entrepreneur. Um, one of those uh, experiences was in the insurance industry, albeit in the life insurance industry, but I have a deep appreciation of the dynamics at play, especially when it comes to underwriting and, and managing risk. I understand that um, insurance is a way to um, share risk across uh, policyholders across the population and distribute the cost of that risk. And I also understand that's why it makes it so difficult when you think about insuring against a um, global pandemic, uh, it's impossible to distribute that risk because it affects all of us. But there are things that I think we can do. So um, whether explicitly or, or implicitly, um, most business interruption insurance thereby excludes pandemics as triggering events. That said, I totally sympathize with this, the pains and struggles that uh, our witnesses share today in, in their own businesses and the businesses across my district and across our entire nation. Um, these businesses are struggling and we need to find ways with the federal government, with the industry to help these business first to uh, manage the, the blow, the immediate blow of, of the shutdown, the stay at home orders, but then also to navigate through this crisis uh, ultimately to recovery. And that's what I hope we can find a way to do Republicans and Democrats uh, bipartisan way to do that. And I think that's why last week passing the HEROES Act was a step in that direction. Uh, I think a, a useful guide for the uh, COVID era is looking at the successful public-private uh, model of what we saw with TRIA, the Terrorism Risk Insurance Act. Uh, the impact of the uh, attacks from uh, September 11th, as was earlier noted, were unprecedented and represented an externality that was largely unaccounted for both, both in scope and impact uh, within the existing insurance policies within our economy. Businesses were faced with a profound and direct impact on their financial health and, and insurance companies, even those that had terrorism risk insurance in their policies were overwhelmed. TRIA provides a federal backstop on insurance policies, allowing insurers partial, partial reimbursement for qualifying events. And I think this is a, a good model for us to pursue as we think about uh, pandemic insurance, uh, uh, mitigating that risk. Uh, my first question therefore is to um, Mr. Kevlin, uh, the National Association of Insurance Commissioners estimates 
that applying current business interruption insurance policies to the pandemic could cost the sector as much as $431 billion per month. If it were to retroactively apply business interruption, if we were to apply it to the, the pandemic, what impact would it have on the sector to respond to other claims beyond the pandemic? I know you've touched on this in, uh, broadly, but if you'd be specific, and uh, would it have an impact on the industry solvency? Uh, thank you for the question, Congressman, and uh, appreciate uh, the opportunity. And, and again, going back, it, it would absolutely, any retroactive looking at these contracts would absolutely put systemic strain on the industry. Um, in particular, again, referring to the, the deck that I distributed, there's one slide in particular that, that uh, visually shows, and it's uh, slide number nine, actually. I saw it. Uh, that virtually every single line of insurance will be impacted in some way, shape, or form from retroactivity. And these, it's important to note, these premiums were paid to be so that claims could be made on covered catastrophes. I, I know there's been um, some some uh, discussion about whether or not there was in a, whether or not business insurance intended to cover a pandemic. Um, I tend to, to rely, and, and you actually decided the National uh, Association of Insurance Commissioners, um, and, and specifically, and we actually uh, we, at Triple we've established this COVID issue has taken on a life of its own, and so we've established a micro site. Uh, that, that we're calling the future of American insurance and reinsurance. Uh, it's at fairinsure.org. And you can see quotes from commissioners, the national, the NAIC, the National Association of Commissioners that obviously are saying, you know, not typically well suited for global uh, pandemic where virtually every policy holder suffers. And I think you already made that point. Uh, the Georgia Insurance Commissioner agrees on this, saying most policies, West Virginia, um, and in fact, in terms of, of looking at whether or not there are, are many cases, I think that that needs some context. But we even have an example where the you know, Washington State Insurance Commissioner went out and reviewed and found through the entire state that there were two uh, policies total that included uh, pandemic. And both of those policies were paid. And that that particular insurer actually had to had to make that write down in their in their earnings um, as a result because they were paying the claims. And it was a total of about three billion dollars. Great, um, thank you. Um, and just to say with Mr. Kevlin, there's been discussions in Congress and the Treasury about expanding trade Mr. cover. Mr. Snyder, like your time has expired. So we're gonna have to, we'll have to loop back to you if you still have the remaining questions. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you. And next, I think we have uh, Mr. Stauber from Minnesota. Mr. Stauber, uh, thank you for joining us. So you, you are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, small businesses are hurting. That, that's the bottom line. And I think we can all agree that we need to find a way to protect small businesses from this kind of financial travesty in the future. This is certainly a complicated issue and we must make sure that any policy proposal that arises out of this is well thought out as it is well intended. We also must ensure that the government is not picking winners and losers because by writing policy that favors one industry that may be well-intentioned, we can impose harm on another. So with that in mind, here are my thoughts. Creating a program like TRIA for a pandemic seems like it might have unintended consequences because such a program is capped. It may seem to incentivize folks to shut down as quickly as possible, even before it was truly demanded by government guidelines because everyone would want a shot at the capped pot of money first. So Mr. my question is to Mr. Kevlin. Could you speak to my comments a little more and then how do you think we could avoid such a problem in any sort of public uh, or private programs together? Mr. Kevlin? Yes, Congressman, thank you very much for the question. And what I, what I would first say is uh, we, we need to recognize that this is a different situation. Um, you, you heard me earlier hopefully say, you know, it, when we look at 9-11, we're looking still at limiting time and geography in terms of the economic impact. When we're looking at this pandemic, we're looking at every single economy at play. And so I think it's important, and again, we're not part of the direct policymaking process, but as you do that, I think we need to start at a place where understanding this is different. All of us here doing a, a WebEx hearing, uh, all of us here from uh, every part of the United States uh, recognizes and illustrates just the magnitude that we're dealing with with this. And I think that needs to be the first recognition um, and then also re re recognizing that the enormity of it um, and, and how we exchange the public-private benefit, we need to pay attention to scaling. 
um, and, and how that works because they're, all of our industries want to get up and running. I mentioned how our industry is keeping the, the economy going, paying claims, we're entering into active hurricane. So there, there is an enormity of every single American being impacted here in some way, and we've got to recognize that pandemics are different. And, and so we, I, I, would, I, I would say that we need to recognize that before applying a perhaps previous policy uh, solution um, in, in this. But again, I, I think those discussions will be had. I do, I do want to also recognize that uh, a couple of the, the trade insurance advocacy uh, organizations today announced uh, the, the business continuity uh, protection program as well as a, as a potential solution. And I think coming together in discussions like this, we'll, we'll get there. And I think, and I appreciate uh, that response. And I think, Mr. Chair, to, to my colleagues, I mean, we understand that this is, we know this is a, has to be a bipartisan issue, has to have the information collected. So if there is a program we put together, uh, I'm very confident that that we can do that. And as you said, uh, you know, put party labels aside and really do uh, what we think is necessary. So I, I really believe there could be a win-win, but there's gotta be some great dialogue. And, and, I'm, and I appreciate this opportunity. And I appreciate your comment, comments, Mr. Kelvin. And I yield back, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Mr. Stauber. I appreciate uh, appreciate that, and I think we certainly share the same overarching goal goal here in trying to find some some path forward and solution. Um, now looking at my list, uh, bear with me for one moment, folks. Uh, I think Mr. Burchett uh, from Tennessee is next. Uh, Mr. Burchett, you are recognized for five minutes. On, Are you with us, Tim? Yeah, you can you to, hear me? I might have to unmute. Can you hear me? I can hear you now. You're on. All right. Can you see me? I'm wearing a coat and tie. I just want y'all to know that. I'm not doing it. <laughs> I, I, for you, Mr. Chairman, I had had dinner with or lunch with a constituent and a couple of folks. So I'm, I mean, I'm honored, Tim. You wear a coat and tie for me. Thank you. Yeah. Usually I'm in jeans and socks about this time. I've been working in the yard and I have to take my boots off to come back in. But no, hey, thank y'all so much. I, I had all my questions pretty much been have been asked. I'm, I'm just a, so the, the committee knows I, I was actually a licensed insurance agent. Some of you others have, have mentioned they were too, but um, I, I wonder maybe the uh, the the our distinguished group that's gathered. I'm wondering what the effect could be. We're getting ready to come into hurricane season. There's going to be fires. There's going to be other disasters that we just you know you can't predict. And I'm, I'm, and I'm glad that we we all are in agreement that we can't go retroactive on this issue because it is unconstitutional. And I think that would just bankrupt our, our insurance agents in industry as we know it. And I'm wondering though, if we do dampen our feet in that, in the retroactive pool, what's going to happen when we do, when we come across some of these other catastrophes that are happening in our you know, that will happen, that we know are going to happen. And, and, and will, the in, will the industry even survive if we do that? And also, um, Mr. Chairman, if you could, I know there was mention of a program, a hybrid type program where where if they did go back and retroactively cover these folks under, under virus, if, even if it's not in their policy, if you could get us a fiscal note on that when that comes out, I don't know the process on that. Um, when I was with the state, of Ten when I was in the legislature in Tennessee, you know, the fiscal note always traveled with the bill and we knew exactly what it was going to cost. So if you could provide that for us, I would appreciate it. But if, if the panel would, would answer that question, I would appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Burchett. Who, who on the, anyone on the panel, Chris, I, you're unmuted. You want to, uh, Mr. Morrow, do you want to take a, a cut at that? Uh, no, I, I was just going to say that I, I unfortunately have to go. I was told that this would be an hour to an hour and a half, and I made some other obligations. So I just wanted to thank you all for working on this issue, and um, thanks for your good work and, and good luck. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Morrow. Appreciate your time. Uh, thank and, you, uh, Best of luck to you as well as you uh, address this challenge. I, I can address uh, Congressman Burchett's um, question on the on the uh, yeah, Miss Miss Mr. Hodling, go ahead. Uh, yes, yeah, so Congress Burchin, thank you for asking that particular question. Um, the 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 program that we propose would be an optional one for the insurance industry, not something that forces people to do anything. It's an optional one. If they have a virus exclusion in their policy, 
the, the concept is they would be able to opt into a program, be able to make that payment and receive reimbursement similar to the NFIP type of program. Um, that that is the is the is the proposal, and it is not something that is suggesting of of um, uh, of retroactively looking at it. I too am very concerned about solvency. I'm very concerned about the solvency. I want the insurance industry to work. Um, and and what I see is is that the insurance industry is now it is going to have there are going to be billions and billions and billions of dollars hitting business ins businesses against insurance companies for the next three to five years. I've been involved in almost every major insurance disaster in the last 15 years. I have litigated over the ashes of people's businesses in their lives. This is what will happen. The insurance industry is going to win some of these that at a very high cost. It's also going to lose some of these because there are policies, many of these manuscript policies that provide coverage for contamination of property and property loss, and that triggers the civil authority coverage without question. Um, now, what the lines are getting blurred here is because the industry does not want to pay any of, does not want to contribute at all. It wants to say, look, watch out for our solvency. There is the solvency, however, of the American, American businesses. This is also a big concern and should be a concern to everyone that, that there are businesses that took part of their profit. This business interruption coverage is very expensive. Civil authority extension coverage is very extensive. And in absence of a, a pandemic or a virus exclusion, civil authority coverage applies. Why? Because COVID-19 sticks on surfaces. It causes a dangerous property condition. And that is the reason, the part of the reason for the civil okay. authority and so, and so, so there's going to be some policies that apply, and there may be some policies that not. What our program is is to say. Okay, hey, hey, hold on a second. I, sure. I, I, I'd like for Mr. Kevlin to get the answer. I only have one minute left, so I didn't mean to run on so much. If, if you could do that, let me do yeah, that. Thank you, Congressman. You know, the two points that I would make very quickly, and picking up on, on the discussion here, there is a cost. Um, and, and we are concerned about the cost this is playing as we're, we're seeing a distraction um, from an enormous amount of, of attention being paid to litigation. Whereas, you know, these types of forums and what we're having here, when we recognize the federal government is truly the only entity that can provide the right type of relief, this is where we feel is important for insurance to have a discussion and to come forward. When you put these costs into the litigation system, this is why we have terms these days called social inflation. It adds significant costs to our economy that simply don't need to be there. And we want to avoid those small businesses from being distracted and thinking there's a legal opportunity where this, is, this has precedent. And we saw this again in mad cow disease. We saw this about the direct physical damage in these. I'm not directly a lawyer, but I can tell you that there th that this has played out before and it played out again at a significant cost. And, and thank you, Mr. Kevlin. Uh, uh, time has time is expired. And Mr. Burchett, uh, thank you. Your time has expired. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I don't know what to think about a chairman who jumps out of a perfectly good airplane, though. I'm not sure that but I appreciate you serving our country, brother, and thank you for your well, the, the invitation is always welcome, Tim. You can join me anytime. Yeah, <laughs> I, get, I, get, I, get, I get dizzy at the top of a ladder, brother. That ain't happening. Thank you. <laughs> thank you. The gentleman yields back. Uh, Dr. Joyce uh, from Pennsylvania, you are recognized for five minutes. Uh, thank you, Chairman Crow. Uh, we all recognize that we're in uncharted territory here dealing with the fallout from COVID-19 virus. However, I would caution those on this committee about the law of unintended consequences. In hearing about efforts to change the terms of insurance contracts, force insurers to cover risks like those associated with losses related to a pandemic virus, I can't help but think of my time in the medical profession and as someone with experience working with health insurers on a daily basis. Now, I know health insurance is a bit different from property and casualty insurance, but at the end of the day, the products are still based on the same underlying premise. Insurers take in a premium that is actuarially based on covering certain risks, and the insurer pays out claims to those that purchase such coverage. And in this vein, 
I feel that insurers should cover claims, including those whose coverage existed in business interruption insurance contracts. But forcing insurers to cover a risk where clear exclusions are in place would, in my mind, threaten not only the entire insurance industry, but all insurance policyholders. And at the end of the day, this would lead to premium increases for everyone. This would lead me to a serious concern. And in trying to do a short-term benefit here, it would lead to a longer-term significant harm of substantially higher premiums going forward. This is especially concerning as businesses are already severely struggling with cash flow as we try to reopen our economy. Mr. Kevelin, how would you address this and how would you respond, respond to this, please? Uh, thank you, Congressman. You know, I think what we're seeing now, and, and I mentioned some solutions that are being presented uh, early a few weeks ago in the terms of a COVID relief fund, um, and then now with the business continuity protection program, uh, ways that the industry is coming forward and coming forward with the policyholder community to have discussions in forums like this where we can figure out how do we how do we present forward-looking solutions? Um, and that's that's really critical and key. And how do we we do so with the with, with the backing of the federal government? And I, I am encouraged we see the insurance industry and again the, the policyholder industry having these discussions and working towards solutions because again, going back to the costs of litigation are extraordinary. And I would venture to say that's not where the solutions exist. The solutions exist with the federal government in forums like this where we can have the right dialogues and make sure that we get the solutions that Americans need. Mr. Kevlin, you mentioned the cost of lit litigation. Couldn't you foresee this increasing insurance costs in the long run? Well, I, there, there is absolutely a cost that comes with this. Um, and, and we're talking about, and, and by the way, the costs, the legal costs are not taken out of the surplus. These are, these are taken out of, of the operational costs of the industry. And anytime you have that type of strain, you're raising the cost of risk overall. And that does, that does come back to increase insurance rates. And, and we will no doubt see that as a result. And, and so that's that's where we get this term social inflation. There's an impact on the customer um, that needs to be considered. And there's a distraction as well for this. Small businesses do not need to be distracted uh, by, by trying to, to present legal arguments as much as they, they should be distracted by going and trying to present the solutions or obtain the solutions that the federal government has given already and will have more to come. I think that I commend uh, the chairman for holding this. We all recognize that small businesses are truly the backbone of America. And in the, what we faced in COVID-19, we're seeing that small businesses are the heart of America. Thank you. I thank all the witnesses for testifying today, and I yield the remainder of my time. Thank you, Dr. Joyce. Appreciate uh, your comments and questions. Uh, the gentleman yields back. Uh, I now recognize uh, Mr. Bishop from North Carolina. Uh, Mr. Bishop, are you still with us? I am. Can you hear me and see me? Uh, we, we can, yes. Thank you. You are recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and uh, and thank you, the panelists, all of you. Uh, it's a very important discussion. Mr. Huffling, if I could sort of seek a little clarity from you. Uh, you, you said that insurance companies uh, should live by the word of their contracts, and, and that means that if the language of the policy covers a pandemic or virus uh, that they should cover, they should pay. And if it doesn't, they shouldn't, right? And I, you're muted, sir. Congressman, that's exactly right. Uh, they should live by the words of the contract. The problem is that the industry, um, and it's very, it's, it's very clear today, the, the industry has pushed out um, this message that all policies do not include uh, civil. Well, let, me, let me just re reclaim my time, Mr. Huffman. So I appreciate that. I mean, there may be disputes over that, and they usually get resolved in court. And I understood you're saying that there's cost to be concurred and going through all that litigation. So I understand that. Um, Congress, though, literally can't change that result uh, or the contract language that leads to it. Though you've made that point as well. Fair. I agree. Okay. So let me see clarity on what your proposal is. Insurers get to opt in to some system. 
And it, I think with the little one page document I saw says if they opt in, they still have to pay the business interruption claims that their policies cover. Is that correct? Um, well, yes. It, what we're not trying to do is to give a windfall to any in, any particular industry. If you if you okay. took the premiums, but, but, but they also let me if, let me reclaim my time. Then I just want to get so. But what they uh, what they uh, if they opt in though, then they can also pay business interruption claims for which they don't have coverage liability and get reimbursed. Is that right? The argument is yes. If if they if they opt in, it's an optional program. They don't have to opt in. They can go to court. They can take the, they can take their money and they can pay their defense lawyers and they can and they can fight it. But there there is going to be there are some policies that clearly provide coverage that they're not okay. paying. And then so, there's so what you're saying. I think what your I think then, what your proposal then is, sir, is it not that if an insurance company is uncertain about whether it has a good exclusion or not, then it's going to opt in and it's going to transfer its risk to the American taxpayer by just voluntarily seeing those payments or those, uh, those claims paid for, and then the taxpayers pay for it, or more correctly, a future generation's taxpayers, because we don't have any money, we just got debt, right? Uh, well, no, actually, I don't think so, because what you're gonna have here is that, is right now what the industry is proposing, what the insurance industry is proposing, is just proposing another pot of money to pay for the employees that are on unemployment lines. Okay, another taxpayer pot of money. What we're suggesting is no. In this situation, that's not fair for the taxpayers to pay for things that policy premiums have been paid for. If policy premiums, if there are businesses that took out their profits well, for I, a year, I, I'm not, I don't think we're, I don't think we're in dispute about Mr. Huffman. I don't think we're in dispute about about the policies about the paying policies that they're exposed on. We've already said that. I've already we I stipulate everybody does that they should. The question is who pays for coverage that they don't have a contractual obligation on. And you're saying that's going to be passed to the government. The government's going to reimburse them. And the cost of that would have to be borne by taxpayers. Well, there's going to be some, there's some policies, there's a big dispute on the language. The language is not clear. The, the language does not say in most policies, in 99.99% of policies, it does not use the word pandemic. It does not ex particularly exclude pandemics, but it has words in there where there can be a legitimate dispute, Congressman. And the, and the argument is, if we do nothing, if Congress does nothing on this issue, then, then the subset of ones where they may be a dispute, it could go either way. There is going to be litigation that's going to pit American businesses against insurance companies, because there's a lot of American businesses, Congressman, and, and, right. and you're and others that believe they have, that they have coverage, and there is a dispute. Now, some- Thanks, Mr. Dispute, Huffling. Hang on, hang on, Mr. Huffling. Just reclaiming my time. Appreciate your point. Just quickly to Mr. Kevlin. Uh, under the opt-in idea that Mr. Huffling is describing, wouldn't uh, I mean if someone has a has a clear exclusion of coverage, why would an insurance company opt in opt into such a system? Well, thank you, Congressman. I think what what this comes back to is the notion that global pandemics are uninsurable, and so where my question is is why is this an insurance issue, um, and why and why aren't we again looking at this? as the pandemic is, which is affecting every single industry all at the same time. Um, this industry is designed to pay and is paying its covered claims right now. Um, it's been very clear um, that language in contracts uh, in terms of the virus and bacteria exclusion is, is located on what's called the declarations page. It's worked, that language is worked out hand in hand with the regulatory community. So I, I, I don't want I think you have a whole thought. I, I wanna make sure you have your time. Yeah, I'd love to be able to converse with both of you more, but my time's expired. The chairman's been uh, indulgent. Thank you, sir. I yield back. Thank you, Mr. Bishop. Appreciate uh, your questions and for joining us today. Uh, so I believe uh, we um, believe we have gone through all of the members here. Let me check with staff. Yes. Okay. So we've gone through all the members and out of respect for uh, the panelists, uh, uh, thank you for bearing with us. We went a little bit over time, but wanted to make sure uh, a we got through all the members and everyone had a chance to to voice their their questions and concerns. So let me begin uh, by thanking uh, first and foremost the panelists for joining us, uh, particularly the the business owners uh, and uh, the heads of the businesses uh, for taking time away. Uh, you you all are on the front lines of trying to make sure you keep Americans employed, you keep our small businesses uh, moving. Uh, you're doing incredible work. 
Um, we're working hard to, to stand by you and give you the aid uh, that you need. Uh, so thank you very much for joining us. Uh, thank you to all the members for joining uh, and for uh, participating in what is a spirited discussion. Uh, these are hard issues. These are hard times. Uh, and uh, obviously, uh, uh, that, you know, when you're in a situation like that, uh, you have a spirited discussion. But we, we heard a variety of perspectives and thoughts and views, which was the point of the forum, to make sure that we, we heard things uh, and that everyone had a chance to voice their questions and concerns. So I think it was successful in that uh, sense, uh, uh, for sure. I also want to thank the staff of the Small Business Committee uh, for adapting and putting together this, this forum and this platform. Uh, they've been working really hard the last 10 weeks to respond to a very unprecedented uh, environment. Uh, and not only are they dealing with um, uh, entirely new programs and PPP and an idol and everything like that, but also putting together these forums. So thank you to the, the staff as well. So just to, to finalize and close up, uh, I think one of the risks when you're in an environment like this and uh, when stakes are very high, uh, there, there's a risk of always falling into an all or nothing mentality. This idea that Either you do everything or you do nothing. Uh, but that is normally not where the path forward uh, exists. There's usually a path forward somewhere uh, where you can come together and you can compromise. I didn't hear any of the panelists today talk about uh, rewriting contracts and covering people uh, um, you know, back in time that weren't covered or don't even have insurance. I didn't, I didn't hear that perspective voiced by the panelists and I am not hearing that perspective voiced by very many people, uh, frankly, around the country. Um, what the, the focus of this was about was that subset of businesses that actually have business interruption insurance, you know, the third or so of businesses that have paid substantial amount of money uh, to uh, buy this coverage. Uh, and then you have another subset, you have exclusions uh, for uh, specifically uh, car routes for pandemics and viruses, which does seem to indicate to me that if there are exclusions articulated in certain policies, that this is actually something that has been on the radar insurance. And this is something that they have thought about. Uh, and have excluded uh, uh, for certain policies and in certain industries. Uh, so we have to address uh, that component as well. Uh, and then uh, the, the fact that the, the industry has, in, in fact, taken out insurance themselves, reinsurance uh, on their reserve, uh, and um, has done so uh, uh, recognizing that uh, there could be a, a large event that would use up all of their cash reserves, like we are anticipating. That, in fact, is what reinsurance is about. So uh, all of those things said, uh, I do look forward to working with uh, the, the members of this committee uh, on both sides of the aisle to try to figure out if there's a path forward uh, that um, everybody can live with, that keeps uh, industries and businesses solvent, uh, that uh, honors the, the terms of contracts and provides aid to businesses uh, that so desperately need it. Uh, and um, my door is always open, my phone is always on to have those conversations. So thank you all for joining uh, us during this forum. Uh, be safe and be healthy uh, and have a good rest of your week.